Well, welcome to another How Conversation on Moral Leadership. Today, we are really blessed to have with us Lieutenant General Richard Milo Clark, the 21st Superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy, a dear friend and colleague. Rich, it's welcome to the How Conversation, and it's so good to see you. Great to see you too, Dana. Thanks for allowing me to take part in this. I, I think this is a great initiative, and I'm uh, really honored to be a part of it. Well, great. Well, let me check in with you first and find out how you and your family are faring during these unprecedented times. You just made a big move from the D.C. area back out to Colorado Springs, Colorado. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. Uh, we love being at the Academy. This is our, our second time here, and uh, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. And Academy is as great as ever. Uh, being a part of developing leaders of character, you, you couldn't ask for a better job. Um, even in these tough times that we're in, uh, I'm, we're just thrilled, thrilled to be here. So uh, family's great and we're loving life. I did mention that you were the 21st superintendent. You're the first black superintendent that we have had, which has made the headlines and um, it's wonderful. You also were the 25th Commandant of Cadets. You have a long history uh, graduating from the Air Force Academy in 1986. Uh, you have 42 hundred uh, hours, in, mostly in the bomber, but also refuelers, which is a tough task, as well as trainers and the C-21, 400 hours in combat. You have served in Iraq, and you've uh, served at the highest levels of our Air Force and our joint forces. Uh, you also have four master's degrees and an honorary PhD. I'm going to start with the first question and getting at uh, Wow, you've been in the job now just a couple of months, and what a very challenging time to take on these responsibilities. What have the few first months been like, and how are you building the Air Force Academy community during these times? Yeah, Dana, well, it has been tough. Um, it's been tough for the Academy for several months now with uh, COVID-19 and the way that we're um, continuing to develop our leaders here for, uh, for our Air Force and our Space Force. So next May, we will graduate um, our class of, of Academy grads. But, but really, the first and foremost to us is the health and safety of the cadets. Um, we have to make sure that uh, they are able to execute their mission and that we're able to get them through here without any, um, any complications or issues related to COVID. So that's always first and foremost for us. Well, when you press ahead together, I know you're faced with uh, really challenging decisions and oftentimes you're confronted with no good options. I know recently having to keep all the students there through the holidays is a very difficult decision, but you have to make many. How do you approach those decisions when it looks as though, you know, there's no real one that everybody's going to like? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I, I wish I had a a, a cookie cutter answer to that one, but you really have to take each decision um, at its at its value and, and what that decision is and what it's going to do uh, for our priorities that I, that I just talked about. We we try to stay in line with those, and it, it's hard to to keep them in in a particular order at any given time. But we really have to balance those priorities and make sure that we're achieving them in the right way. And every partner, every teammate that we have really comes at it with a, with a different perspective. So it takes a collaborative approach. I mean, we have to talk through these things and we have to figure out what are the, the second and third order effects of our, uh, our decisions. And then basically uh, we, we have to execute. And once we make a decision, it, it's important that we all own it and that we move together and, and execute together. So um, it's, a, it's a process. But really, in the end, it's about a team coming together, collaborating, making the right uh, decisions for, for the situation we're in, and then moving forward with it together. One of the priorities you said was high on your list was to inspire everyone to understand their purpose, which really resonates. Our founder and our chairman, Dove Seidman, who's the author of the book, How? I'm going to read a quote from him and then ask a question with regard to purpose. Because he said, human systems cannot function without formal authority, whether it's the commander in chief, a CEO, a general officer, school principal. But what makes organizations really work is when leaders occupying those formal positions have moral authority too. 
While formal authority can be seized, won, or bestowed, moral authority must be earned by who you are and how you lead. And so I'd like to ask you what you meant by that priority and how you go about that, inspiring people to understand their purpose. That, that's a great question, and <clears throat> that was a great quote as well. And helping people to understand the purpose of uh, here at the Academy of why they're here and, and what that purpose is, is meant to achieve um, is critical. And, and what we have to do is really help to, to take every airman, every cadet, every person that's involved in our mission so that they can be able to draw the lines directly from what they do to that higher purpose. And ideally, they understand that that purpose is bigger than themselves as an individual. And I think when people get that, when they know that it's bigger than themselves, that it really does inspire them to, to greater um, performance. It inspires them to, um, I think, a greater commitment because they know that it will have an impact on, on the broader good, on the greater good. So we, we constantly try to help people draw that line and, and understand what, why what they do leads to the, the higher purpose. And for us in the military, a lot of times it, it's the Constitution. We take an oath of office to support and defend the Constitution. And, and that alone, I mean, that set of ideals that makes our country what it is, that makes it great, um, is something that we all hold near and dear to our hearts uh, in the military. But, but there may be other things. I mean, people have other, other things that are bigger than them that uh, they may come in, other values that they bring in from wherever they come from in the world or in the, in the community or in the United States. That might be another purpose that they aspire to that drives them every day. So I think one of our goals is to remind people every day that it's about something bigger than themselves, that what they're doing isn't just for them, but that it's leading to a greater cause. And, and I think that that's helpful for us, but it's easy to forget it, especially when times get tough and you're, you're kind of wondering, why am I going through this? Why would I get up every day to do the things that I have to do here? But if you don't remember the purpose, that could be really tough to go through some of the difficulties and the challenging times. But if you do remember that purpose, perhaps, perhaps you'll be inspired um, to excel every day and, and to go to that next level. So we have to constantly remind it, we have to be consistent about it, and, and we have to live that purpose ourselves as leaders to set the example so that others can follow. Has your strategy for inspiring people and helping them to understand their purpose had to change during these times? Uh, yeah, honestly, Dan, it's been tough because a lot of times we're able to, to impart that purpose in face-to-face in, in -face -face contacts. You, you can bring people into a room and talk to them, um, help them to communicate with each other even about their purpose and to help each other understand it. But in these times of COVID, uh, getting together and that face-to-face -face opportunity is really gone. It's lost um, in a lot of ways. So we do it through um, other means. But, but sometimes those other means are a little bit difficult because we're not used to them. Um, they're, they're things that we have to sort of establish the, the procedures on how we do it. And, and I think in, in those human interactions, you, you sometimes lose something um, when you can't meet face-to-face. -face. So we've established a lot of different ways to communicate, to connect, um, and to, to keep our team together. But, but it's more of a challenge. It's a bit difficult for us to do it. So um, COVID has, has given us some, uh, some opportunities, I think, to find new ways to do things. And hopefully we're getting better. I remember our one chief of staff, Chief 21, General Goldfein, used to always say, never let a good crisis go to waste. So we're finding ways to do things now that I think uh, will help us do better later but we really do have to polish them and, and make sure that they work for us and, and find the best practices. So yes, we are changing our ways just a bit. Yeah, staying true to the why, but uh, adjusting the how to be influential in, in raising people up, inspiring and elevating and meeting the mission, it sounds like. Let me exactly. bring it a little bit closer to home uh, into your moral compass 
and tying that to the fact that you had huge responsibilities for the Air Force nuclear deterrence program and your moral compass probably was challenged in some of that work. How do you stay true to your values when there's these tumultuous or sometimes ethically challenging decisions or times that you face? Well, that, that's a really good question. In a nuclear enterprise, a lot of times people can look at um, nuclear capabilities as, uh, as devastating, destructive, and um, just uh, systems that, that we don't need to have on the planet. But the, the truth of the matter is they are on the planet. And, and we have, there's something that we have to deal with, especially in the global environment, because we have peer competitors that also have these weapons. And when I, when I think about what others might say um, about nuclear weapons, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is deterrence. The idea of these weapons is not that we would use them, but that we never have to use them. And, and as I sort of navigate through um, managing my job and, and working uh, through acquiring these systems or um, um, executing the, the mission, I, I keep in mind that this is about deterrence. It's about not having to fight and to ensure that our adversaries don't want to fight. Mm -hmm. And that their calculus is such that they, they never want to attack the United States. So I go back to that purpose of, of supporting and defending the Constitution and ensuring that our country is, is safe and secure is a, is a large part of that. And our deterrence mission with nuclear weapons is a, a significant part of that mission. So. Um, I, I think when you when you ask how do I sort of navigate that, it's it's very clear to me that deterrence um, is a um, I would say a critical part of our national defense strategy, which in turn is a critical part of supporting and defending our constitution. So I, I think I'm I'm comfortable in the mission, but it is certainly, as you mentioned, uh, controversial, and a lot of people look at that as a a, a moral or ethical dilemma, but um, I think staying true to my purpose, I'm able to navigate that. You once said, as the commander in charge of employing strategic deterrence capabilities for the nation and our allies, I simply don't have the luxury of assuming a crisis, conflict, or war won't happen. Based on that, assuming war is always a possibility, what or who would you say is the biggest geopolitical threat to the U.S. or the Western moral leadership values we hold today? So Dana, our, our national defense strategy really lays that out very clearly for us, who our near peer competitors are. And there, there's no question that it's China and Russia. And we look at both of those competitors, not only in conflict, but at, at levels of uh, activity below the level of conflict. And, and how do we compete in the global environment with our near peer competitors? So. Um, when I talk about deterrence or we talk about conflict in the gray zone, where, where that area that's, that's not conflict, it's important that we're always uh, ensuring that the U.S. has uh, uh, the right footing and the right um, standing in the, in the world environment. And those are the two near peers that we're most concerned about and that we have to compete with um, daily um, in the global world. So, um, yeah, they are, they are there, and our national defense strategy certainly has us um, in a great power competition with them. Um, what do you think is the biggest morality-based leadership dilemma we're facing today? I, I think the, the dilemma between us and our near-peer competitors is really about um, the distinguishing between what's healthy competition and, and what's not. We, we don't want to compete to the point where it, it drives us into a place that we don't want to be with our adversaries. But then there's a, also healthy competition that every nation state um, is engaged in. And in, in many ways, I think people could see that as healthy. And it is. It, it makes our country better. It's, in some ways, it makes the, the global environment better. But when that competition starts to border on on unhealthy or drives us into a situation where miscalculations can happen or inadvertent actions could lead us in closer to conflict, I think we have to understand that, that we have a moral responsibility 
to, to stay away from that, to not drive us into a conflict um, that could lead to war. And um, that's important for our, um, our leaders to understand really what is it, what is winning? What does winning look like? What does competition look like? And, and what are the boundaries of that competition so that we can be in a good place, in a healthy place in the global environment? Well, that's uh, two wonderful comments. I was reminded when you said healthy competition of a book called True Competition, which is really about pushing each other to our best performance. Uh, yet when you get to the finish line, right, you wanna win. Absolutely. <laughs> and so your questions about what does success look like and what's healthy competition are two really powerful moral leadership questions. And I'd like to build on that to ask, you know, what is the best strategy to spread and protect moral leadership around the world? I think um, the best strategy is, is really to have the level of collaboration, especially with allies and partners, to ensure that, that you build that, that coalition that allows us to, uh, to be competitive and not only compete alone, but compete with those that would support us uh, in the world. And, and so that's a leadership issue, clearly. Um, and it's something that I think our country has, um, has been good at. And, and really, I think we're, we're probably, in my view, and I think the view of many others, we're better at building allies and partners than some of our adversaries. And throughout history, it's been a, we call it a center of gravity, where our, where our power emanates from is having those allies and partners that are by our side. And when we find ourselves in difficult situations, we know that they're there. But, but what's required there is that we're with them in good times or bad times and, and we're together. So um, it, it's a two-way street, certainly building great alliances, um, but it's something that I think we as a country, um, we as leaders in our country have to focus on and ensure that we continue to build for our future. And if we had to paint a picture or an example of what a healthy competition or unhealthy competition was, which, what, what examples come to mind for you? Well, sometimes you, you think about the areas that we're competing, um, certain economic um, competition, it could be healthy. You know, when, when, you're, when you're working within the bounds of of trade norms um, and economic norms, I think that's healthy competition. But when we start to, to stray outside of what those norms are, that's when we start to get unhealthy. That's when uh, potential conflict starts to rear its head. So um, when we do all abide by the national, the international norms that, um, that have been established over decades and, and even centuries, um, I think when we're within those bounds, it's healthy, but we, we find ourselves constantly, um, you know, uh, rebuking our adversaries for uh, straying outside and they rebuke us because they believe we did the same. And, and that's up to our leaders to really ensure that, that we continue to move ourselves into a place where everybody's, uh, everyone's competing at, on a level playing field. And, and now it's, it's up to, uh, the efforts and the, the sound, solid, I, I would say moral efforts of, of every nation to compete in a, in a fair and, and uh, appropriate way. And I heard uh, a loud theme of trust that obviously is developed there when you operate uh, based on those norms, which is so Absolutely. important. Well, you are in the business of developing moral leaders and you have been doing that for your uh, career, but especially your responsibilities uh, as the commandant and now as the superintendent. I'm curious for our listeners if you might talk about uh, developing moral leaders and how that happens. I mean, there's always the question, are leaders born or are they made? And obviously, they have to be born to be made, but, you know, we, we develop leaders. What about, is it teaching moral leadership? Is it, is it by the school of hard knocks on the field? What's your response to how do we develop moral leaders? I think it, it, some of it is teaching. Some of it is the school of hard knocks. Um, I think a lot of it is by example and understanding not only current examples of moral leaders, but 
historic examples of moral leaders and, and the choices that we make, both good and bad examples, are, are important. And we uh, here at the Air Force Academy do use historic examples to, um, I think, set the stage for future leaders to understand how they should respond, how they should react, how they should do, make tough decisions. Um, and, and still be moral and ethical in, in the decision-making that, um, that they execute. Um, but I also think there's, there's certain, um, I would say, academic efforts that we can put into this so that they understand sort of what the elements of moral leadership are and, and what it really takes for a person to call themselves a moral leader and the kinds of characteristics that they should exhibit in, in moral leadership. So, I think it's a combination of all of that. We all make mistakes. So like you mentioned, the school of hard knocks is certainly one way that we learn, but um, watching others, current, past um, leaders is another way. Um, but here at the Academy, we pull all of them together to try to help folks understand what is it that's required of a moral leader? What does that look like? And, uh, and give them opportunities to make those decisions. Um, you, you do have to have chances to fail and, and know that you failed and then own those failures and get better from them. And I've seen you exemplify moral leadership uh, in, in our service together. And I've always marveled at your seeing the humanity in everyone, which is one of the moral leadership practices, whether it's a brand new, uh, you know, fourth classman, freshman, uh, to some of our senior most leaders in the Department of Defense and beyond and around the globe as you've served in other positions. And you, you somehow established that trust. How would you say you go about building that? What's your secret? Well, first, I appreciate that. That was very kind of you. Um, how, how true all that is, I don't know. But I, I will tell you this, as far as <clears throat> if I'm understanding your question, how do I um, establish the trust of the of the people that I'm uh, that I work with that I either lead or am being led by. My my entering position is that that people have my trust and it's there for them to lose. And and I think that um, most times, I mean, with few exceptions, people keep trust. Once you give it to them and you empower them with that trust, they don't want to lose it. And I think most of us know that it it's it's easy to lose trust, but it's really, really hard to get it back. So people guard that trust with, uh, with everything they have once they get it. So I, I tend to give it to people and, um, and they tend to keep it. Um, I also, when I'm given trust, I, I think I respond in the same way. I, I try to do everything I can not to lose someone's trust. So um, it, it's, it's much simpler and easier also to, to start out just trusting people and, and to go into a situation that way. So, so that's just been the way that I've done it. Um, and I think probably because other people have, have behaved that way with me and they've given me trust and, and allowed me to, uh, to move along with it and to go with it. Wonderful. Well, starting with why and spreading that forward as well as showing how and impressing on people, you know, how you live your why is also incredibly important. Lieutenant General Richard Clark, it is wonderful to see you again. Thank you for sharing with us your wisdom and your secrets, which you say aren't secrets, uh, and you're humble in your response. Uh, but we're so grateful for the time that you've shared with us today. And we wish you all the best in the remainder of your tour and onward and upward we go. Thank you, Dana. It's great spending some time with you. And I wanna thank you and your team once again for what you're doing here and just helping us all to understand a little bit more about our own personal leadership, but, but the, the understanding of leadership in general. So thank you for that. And thanks for letting me be a part of it. 